Yes, so one thing that is missing in my title is Canada 150, so I thought I should just make some acknowledgement about that and celebrating anniversaries, and uh, mainly to observe that this wonderful Pemberton history book is now 40 years old, and that's a really an anniversary to celebrate. It's been so durable, it's really a unique local history uh, achievement, and uh, so uh, now 40 years old, it's hard to believe. And I'll come back to this book a little bit later. And only $20. <laughs> so yes, I am going to dare to cover the topic of Pemberton in world history. And uh, Pemberton history in the world. The world being a Vancouver newspaper that I'll be introducing shortly. Thank you. Newspapers are uh, something I've been giving a lot of thought to lately with my colleagues in our Forestry Centre project in Squamish. Forest history in this corridor, a lot of it is in the old newspapers. And so we're taking great care to figure out orienting ourselves as to how to obtain uh, the information from newspapers, where are they, which archives are they held in. There's quite a number of them to work with, about half a dozen in this corridor. And uh, there are some challenges. Um, and one of the things that uh, we're noticing in projects, uh, local history projects, is how newspapers have changed over time. And an example of that for me comes, has come in during the course of writing a local theatre history in Squamish, community theatre, uh, 35 years of the House on Drama Club, which was also active here in Pemberton and collaborating with local Pemberton folks at various times between 1965 and 2000. And here is a collage of newspaper clippings and reviews from the 1960s. Now watch what happens in the 1970s. And now in the 1980s. Uh, Newspapers change over time. I'm going to go back again to the 1960s. And a lot of these people are writing detailed, print-heavy reviews. bona fide reviews. Unfortunately, few people find their way into our newspapers today. And that's not so much about the people, it's about how newspapers and their function have changed over time. 1980s, we come to be heavy on photos and titling and less on real detailed and solid work on telling what's going on in this particular production. And we find that in uh, how newspapers cover many realms. So newspapers are changing. We're in a bit of a transition. So the newspapers that I'm going to be focusing on are from earlier part of the 20th century for the most part. And I'd like to start with Pemberton in world history, as told in newspapers. That is Pemberton on the world stage, Pemberton as part of a worldwide international story. And I'm going to suggest there's at least nine such stories. I'm just giving examples where we can think about Pemberton in world history. So I'm going to start with the gold rush. Surely an international story. In fact, this is newspaper clippings from Melbourne, Australia, 1859. They had access during the gold rush. Newspapers right around the world were tapped into the Fraser River Gold Rush as it was happening. So even we have the Bridge River Gold, latest from the Fraser, the Squamish River, and Pemberton. Almost immediately, this information was available in Melbourne, Australia, Hong Kong, London, England, of course, uh, all around the world. So the gold rush, uh, Fraser River gold rush, happened at a time when information about what was going on traveled through newsprint all around the world, all, right away. So that is something that uh, is, uh, is quite interesting. And uh, here we have a, the a Caribou, uh, the Quinell newspaper in 1867. Probable important discovery. It's hard to even consider a, any gold rush without some kind of information channel that's going to be working to distribute the, the knowledge. It isn't just word of mouth, the gold rush. In San Francisco, the Fraser River Gold Rush was written about in their newspapers. It was the newspapers that mobilized so many of those people to come here. And another thing that was going on during the Fraser River Gold Rush, photography. Both photography and newspapers were well established. And our BC Gold Rush is full of 
photo documentation, including this 1865 photo of Port Pemberton by the Italian-Canadian photographer <coughs> Carlo Gentile. And so the gold rush we have is well documented in photographs. And that's also something we can consider alongside the newspapers. So the next world story that Pemberton is a part of is the Klondike, I would suggest. There may be many stories that we can refer to, but I'm going to pick the Klondike as the next one. The Klondike and its marbles. This is from the world, the Vancouver newspaper in 1897. Alaska as a new railroad field is now beginning to attract attention because there's gold up there. By way of the Pemberton Meadows. Pemberton Meadows, you just can uh, go through the search engine for a, a, a newspaper like this. Every issue mentions the Pemberton Meadows at this time. Because it's how you're going to get up there to the Klondike. So, Pemberton Meadows, part of world history, part of the Klondike. Also because a lot of the people who came back from the Klondike, settled here. Charles Barber, the Ronans, at least some branches of the Ronan family, I'm not as familiar with it, I believe Jack Ronan came to Pemberton with Charles Barber. They both came down from the Klondike. So in that sense, Pemberton is a part of world history, part of the Klondike story. Another one, well here, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Barber and Child are at the Commercial Hotel in Vancouver. Mr. Barber has made considerable money in the north and now proposes going into the lumber business on the coast in Squamish, but he also bought a bunch of land here in Pemberton. We'll come back to that. Another story that is an international story that Pemberton and this valley is a part of is the growth of modern humanistic anthropology, the study of our Aboriginal people in this part of the world major achievements right here in, the, in this valley that are today standard references for anybody involved in the field of anthropology through, through two people essentially Franz Boas from Germany who settled eventually in the United States and here in 1894 spending several weeks among the Lillooet tribes right here in this valley and he met up with James Tate last week your guest speaker Johnny Jones mentions James Tate, uh, a colleague. Now, Franz Boas, I should just mention, the first person to name these tribes accurately and their languages and make solid efforts to build a map and a, and a picture of these people and their languages and sort it all out. And uh, he was really a remarkable pioneer of this field of modern anthropology. And Part of that story is right here in this valley. James Tate, who married a woman from the Fraser Canyon, and his uh, association with Franz Boas is very close, and uh, he produced a number of works. This one was referred to by Johnny Jones last week here at the Pemberton Museum, The Lillooet Indians by James Tate, 1906, published with the assistance of Franz Boas with the Smithsonian Institution. It is, a, it is a standard reference for anybody in the field. And another work by James Tate, called Basketry in British Columbia and surrounding region, full of a collaboration information that comes from local families in this valley. And this is a, a very famous book. You would have to spend several hundred dollars to acquire a copy. And, um, but it is a standard work on uh, uh, an inspiring work today in, in this field. So this is produced with the collaboration of families in this valley. So another story, a tragic one, the Spanish influenza. Immediately following the war, towards the end of it, special train, because our First Nations communities in this corridor were badly hit by the Spanish influenza. Everybody was. The doctors couldn't, were, were often, um, uh, yeah, effective. And so as is related here, Dr. Morley has been down with influenza himself. He was the one that was going to come up on the train to visit the villages here. And we can see in this other report all of these stories from the Vancouver World newspaper. 200 cases at Pemberton. That's part of a world story. Um, 40 deaths just to here in, in, in the local community in, at 
among the Lowa people. The white man's curse, another one. So there's another world story that Pemberton is a part of. Another story I suggest that is a world story that's underappreciated is the school at Mount Curry. I remember I did some work up in Northwest BC uh, with a representative for the Gicks and uh, Wet'suwet'en during their trial and, and, and legal campaign, and he was a school teacher here. And he told me how he was so inspired to come to work at a school that was administered by Aboriginal people. He came all the way from Northwest BC to work here at Mount Curry at the DeSeal School. And I went in the Vancouver Public Library, and how do you find out about this school? You go to newspapers and newspaper clippings and all these files that are in the filing cabinet there. Someday, somebody, we all need to realize how precious that history is. Because that's where, that's where it is. It's nowhere else other than in people's memories. But that's where it's preserved, and that's how it's preserved. The story of that, that school at Mount Curry that was so inspirational right across the country. It was such a pioneering project of, of the local community taking, taking charge of their, of their program. 